There's some blackouts. Yeah. yeah, it'll go away. There you go. Okay. 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 Yeah. It helps in all this to remind ourselves constantly what the Bible is given to us for. One of the most famous statements of inspiration in the Bible itself puts it like this. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. Second Timothy. Equipped for every good work. There's the point. The Bible is breathed out by God. The word for inspired in this case is theonumostus, literally God breathed, so that it can fashion and form God's people to do his work in the world. In other words, the Bible isn't there simply to be an accurate reference point for people who want to look things up and be sure they've got them right. It is there to equip God's people to carry forward his purposes of new covenant and new creation. It is there to enable people to work for justice, to sustain their spirituality as they do so, to create and enhance relationships at every level, and to produce that new creation which will have it about it something of the beauty of God himself. Thanks, Vicki. Mm -hmm. And let's, uh, Becca, we'll leave some prayer. Eternal God, we celebrate your gift of abundant life. We rejoice in the ways you have come to us in Jesus Christ, in the words of scripture, in the prayers of your people, and in the expressions of faith of those who gather to know more of you. Continue to guide us toward your goal and grant us hope and anticipation for all that lies before us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. Okay. Oh, um, I'm kind of debating here whether to go into our, uh, you know, go into our, our readings um, and then, you know, I really want to talk more about the whole the whole process and everything and what this has meant for everybody. Um, but maybe um, maybe we'll start. Let's just go ahead and start with our regular practice and and take a look. Since this is our first time, I think that we've studied a whole book, right? Going through yes. all, of, all of Philippians, and um, uh, you know, as we uh, reflect on this, I think we can also reflect on the journey that we've been on. You know, in some of the things that, you know, as we read them, and uh, maybe there's some new skills that we picked up along the way that um, you've put into, you know, some of your readings for tonight, too. So um, let's, uh, let's take a look at, um, at Philippians uh, 1 through 11, 1, 1 through 11, first of all. And um, well, first, backing up just a little bit, um, why were we asked to look at Philippians here as our closing uh, book, you think? Closing discovery. I think it kind of summarizes Paul's teachings in a way um, and talks about what we can do if we follow Christ. Okay. I mean, in our lives, like life application type stuff. Um, the chapter is called the goal and i know a couple of the readings featured words about the goal mm -hmm. paul was talking about uh i'm not sure that that was all of what he was writing about this is sort of just a, a good look at what paul's letters are like mm -hmm. i found it to be really an encouraging letter you know, um, I think maybe that's partly also why we have it as our last study is it's a real encouragement mm -hmm. to keep going. Ari said that at Whitworth, um, a professor that he took for one of his Bible classes has an entire semester long class just on Philippians. Yeah. And that's all they study. And I said, well, there's a lot in it. I can see that. Mm -hmm. 
it, it helped me to change my view in a way of Paul. Uh, I felt there, there was so much encouragement and he always included the women. And you go back to, I can't remember where it is. And I, and I know I was told that the reason he told the women that they shouldn't speak in church, blah, 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 was because they would be, asking, they didn't hear and they would be asking each other and talking and which was very disruptive, you know. At least that's the way one pastor ex explained it. But um, I know a lot of us, it just felt kind of, all through my adult life, I've met women who just feel like, Paul is such a downer on women, you know, where this changed all that. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a pretty, you know, overall pretty affirming kind of positive, um, uplifting um letter and uh, you probably recognize some portions in it that you've heard in different settings uh you know either sermons or maybe parts of liturgy um yeah so all right well maybe let's um let's let's go into first or philippians 1 1 through 11 and uh, just share some of our notes yes. I just started with the quote, I think, my God, every time I remember you constantly praying with joy, dot, 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 because of your sharing in the gospel, that Paul is thankful for the Christians in Philippi and prays that their, quote, love may overflow more and more with knowledge, and he wants them to be pure and blameless when Christ returns. That's his prayer for them. Mm -hmm. And of course, where is he writing this from? Prison. Prison. Somewhere, yeah, yeah prison somewhere. Mm -hmm. I yeah. always think of Paul as kind of a loner in a way. I mean, you know, he very intentional about what he did and initiated a lot of stuff, but he finds joy in his partnership with these people. Yeah. And it's, that it's seems like a, a maturing or a maturer kind of view of, of the faith and, and how it's developed in people. His his greeting is uh, from Paul and Timothy, uh, which is you know whether whether Timmy had anything to do with the, the writing of it. At least Paul is uh, sharing their task of uh, being examples and uh, encouraging people. Mm -hmm. And in the light of it being like almost all of Paul's writings, he starts out with a, a greeting and ends in a benediction. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of a form within between the details of what he's trying to accomplish. Verses 9 to 11, it's just, it's a beautiful prayer. Mm hmm it's just uh, in its richness and in its focus, you know. Yeah, I wonder, it does have, have the feel, you know, um, that, that maybe as, as he's gotten older, um, you know, he's gotten more, you know, sort of, I don't know, mellow is the word that comes to mind, I guess, uh, and uh, maybe a little more kind-hearted or expressive or something in that regard but it is a really you're right it is a very nice um nice prayer it seems like his hardships may have mellowed him some too yeah um well jerry harris over at walla walla does say that being in prison does cause one to think so he's in prison when he's writing this maybe you know, it, one of, one of the yeah. options is that he's under house arrest, uh, yeah, which was, right. I think, his, his last imprisonment, or at least the third imprisonment that I saw listed. And in that case, he had the uh, ability to have people into his home and, and talk to them and, 
it wasn't the isolated experience of uh, almost being in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. Had an ankle bracelet. Yeah. Yeah. I think the fact that he was in chains or such that and could still express to the people the joy and share the gospel, I think that really got through to the people that uh, um, this was really something real and special that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, the church in uh, uh, Philippi had at some point recognized that, that Paul was in need too, and had sent uh, not only an emissary, but uh, probably some food and necessities all for him. As I know, in one of his letters, he writes about the winter's coming, and uh, I sure wish Mark would bring my jacket with him. Yeah. <laughs> so Wayne, maybe he, they, and uh, Rosalie, they, they sent. Uh, you know, credits or something through JPay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, honestly, the experience that we've been going through with, you know, OPOP and everything has made me think, you know, think about that and looking at this, uh, mm -hmm. this letter, you know, that, um, you know, here's somebody who's in, in prison, whatever the form is, um, you know, he, he has limited, um, you know, access to, to, to money and certainly mobility and things like that. And so people kind of connecting with him, you know, what a difference that must have made. Um, how about uh, we go on to the next uh, portion here, 12 through 30. Speaking of prison. 12 to Well, I wrote that Paul feels like his imprisonment has actually worked for good and has helped to spread the gospel. Other Christians have stepped up and dared to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Um, Paul wants the Philippians to be sure they are living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul tells them that they have the privilege of suffering as he himself hmm. does. Yeah, I think in this passage, it was one of those places where Paul affirms his belief that all things work together. If you look at, I think it's um, 19 through 22, hmm. you kind of get that sense. And I think his statement about even if people are preaching the gospel from wrong motives is pretty astounding. Yeah, yeah, him. isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, I didn't I didn't expect that turn necessarily, you know, when he starts talking about it and then then he says, yeah, but, you know, either way, yeah. it, it's getting out there. And that's what's important. Yeah. Well, it's sort of counting on the Holy Spirit to give the, the right twist to what's being said. I was really struck by. Paul's um, his commitment to the purpose of his life, him saying, I live to support you in your joy and growth in the faith. Like mm -hmm. that is his purpose and he's finding it joyful even despite his circumstances. That's pretty inspirational. Well, I thought he was pretty broad-minded in a way to say, it doesn't matter what the reasons are that people are preaching the gospel if it's to make you know because it says some were doing it just to make money and stuff he says it's the fact that the gospel is being preached hmm. that he could see a good in that yeah for which gospel that was it, but that doesn't that doesn't sound like first corinthians paul in a way does it in no words, it sounds like you know there's a there's a um, maturation maybe that's that's taken place yeah or an acceptance you know mm -hmm. but he can't i mean he can't necessarily control everything um it, yeah so uh at this point paul's been in in ministry what, what do we say the dates of this 54 to 60 or something like that um 
that it was written. Can I see that? Yeah, 54 to 62. Um, so it's later on in his life, um, he's been in ministry for 20, give or take 25 years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then his, you know, his up Christian ministry, I should say, right, his conversion time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then, you know, you, you go back and look at his whole life in terms of studying the Torah and and so on. Um, you know, I mean, how many of us can say that our faith today is the same as it was, you know, 25 years ago? You know, and I mean, and hopefully it's not. Yeah, I mean exactly the same at least. Um, so yeah, it is. Yeah, looking at this at the very end, you know, given what we've studied so far, it is for a fairly humanizing of Paul, and um, even more as I'm just talking about it, just again thinking about this imprisonment piece. Um, you know, we I think we tend to look at it like Paul, some sort of Christian, you know, like a superhero or something, and nothing phases him. <laughs> um, and, you know, how many of us put on a better face? You know, we, we don't want to talk about our own issues or hardships or things, you know, things like that. Um, and, you know, clearly he's been affected by these things. And, you know, if yeah. say prison makes you a little more philosophical, it, it certainly um, could be the case for Paul. I think Paul, though, recognizes also that uh, he's a role model for a lot of these people that have turned to Christ. Uh, he sets himself up as an example. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the reason he mentions some of the things that, uh, you know, he's able to be content in all situations. Uh, repeatedly says rejoice. Uh, and he's Encouraging other people to 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 have the same uh, behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, let's go into chapter two. Um, Anybody have note? Anybody look at any study notes on um, like verses six through eleven? Or yeah, my Bible suggested it might be a hymn, mm -hmm. an early Christian hymn. I found that interesting. I guess that's why it's written, or the the style of it is written a little differently. Is there yeah. any? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the consensus? I don't know what others say. Yeah, it it it, it in, indicates that it's some sort of poetic form rather than uh, a just straight text. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I I'm pretty sure that if you looked at it in the original, you know, some of the original manuscripts, it would all just kind of flow together. Um, so there's there's a lot of interpretation that the um, translators have to make. Um, it's been a lot different if you know, back in the day, they had, you know, word processing and stuff like that, where they could, you know, format stuff. Um, I and mean, we can do all that stuff so easily now, you know, on a computer. But um, so there's, you know, there's, that's one of the, the challenges, you know, we've, one of the things we've talked about is translating the Bible. And um, so there, here's an example of, of one of those kind of challenging aspects where you don't know the full context of it, but it does seem to have um, a, uh, Maybe a more hymn-like character. I, I think if you you could interpret if you interpret it a different way, like it was uh, a part of his sort of uh, like a systematic theology, it would have a different feel to it, perhaps. Um, but even the, the language itself seems a little more a little more poetic than if you were writing a systematic theology. Um, I don't know if anybody else has notes written down from when Paul Matson taught a class on this, but I've got all kinds of notes in mine about how in Greek culture, humility had a negative connotation 
If you were humble, it meant you were looked down on a lower class. And how also how countercultural Jesus was. Hmm. That everything, you know, he humbled himself. He became obedient, even, you know, to the point of death. He also never exalted himself, which was also countercultural. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just, it's fun for me to see these notes from previous classes and go, oh yeah, this was great. You know, so. Yeah. Oh, by the way, um, while we're, well, actually let me, I'll hold off until we get to the beginning of chapter three, I guess, and then I'll, I'll, I'll bring something up. But so um, how about the, any, any other items, maybe the second half of Philippians two? Anybody have a question about working out your salvation? Whoa. I just had a question about that. <laughs> yeah, what, is it, what does it sound like? Well, I mean, he puts a lot of emphasis on uh, our Christian growth being related to the renewing of your mind and uh, greater knowledge and the love. And I think maybe just more, hopefully more fully understanding some of that as you grow uh, in your faith, which I think is apparent even in this epistle for him to some extent. So... I don't think it means I'm responsible for my salvation. If that's what you're uh, Yeah, I think if we read it in the full context of the scriptures and Paul, um, we come up with a different, a different understanding. At a, at a glance, you might think that it has to do with like a work salvation, um, but elsewhere, of course, he talks about uh, grace. Um, scripture we're going to be looking at. Um, a, a week from uh, Sunday from Romans, looking at, um, you know, Abram's decision to follow God's promise, you know, that uh, that was reckoned to him as righteousness, you know, through faith and so on. So if we're, if we're in a chapter that's talking about the, the goal, uh, our salvation uh, might be thought of as the goal or one of the goals, uh, but is it the motivation uh, for our behavior? Um, am, am I going to do good works because I'll get salvation that way? Uh, am I, or am I doing that because Christ has made these sacrifices for me? That's a good question. What, what do what do we what do we glean from this? Um, what kind of answer will we glean from from what we read here? Well, we're not supposed to do these things like he says in um, verse three. Yeah, verse three. Don't do the things out of selfish ambition or vain conceit in other words you're not don't do them to gain something or to impress other people that's not you know you're supposed to be in humility and value others above yourself because that's more christ-like it is i noted that it's kind of funny in uh verse 16 he says it is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And I, I thought it sounded like he was kind of saying, do this for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say that, you know, it seems that the, the purpose uh, is not so much for our own, you know, our own sort of salvation as much as being a witness for others. Well, we can't earn salvation. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of like the image in that little phrase about um, where to go here. Uh, as you hold out the word of life, just kind of 
Uh, I mean, is that a model for witnessing, maybe? Hmm. <laughs> hold it out there. Hold your life out there. Hold the word out there. Just sort of stick it out there. <laughs> hmm. Which verse is that, Wayne? Oh, Becca just read it here as part of it. I think 16. Um, 16. See, yeah. I don't have. Holding fast. Maybe phrased yeah, a little differently in yours, Becca, I think. Yeah, but... it says holding fast to the word of life is oh. what I have. What oh. does yours say? Uh, and it says, and as you hold out the word of life. Huh. In order huh. to... What translation is that? It's in our. Interesting. Okay, and mine says hold firmly to the word. Yeah, that that's what mine says too. Yeah. Oh heck, I kind of like holding it out there. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> it is, it's a really yeah. different image. It's neat. But you might be reaching out there, grasping for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's yeah. offering it. It's sort of offering it as well. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, chapter three. Okay. What did you note in that first section in three? There's warnings. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you notice the tone really changes abruptly. <laughs> and if you looked at some of your notes, um, there's a suggestion that that Philippians could be a combination of a couple letters. Mm -hmm. Um to explain, you know, that that quick change here, you know, it, you get to uh, what the second half of um, three, one, um, and it just goes from finally, my brothers and sisters rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you is not troublesome to me. <laughs> and for you, it is a safeguard and be, beware of the dogs and so on. Mm -hmm. it kind of strikes a different tone. Basically, he's reminding them that they don't have to be circumcised in order yeah. to follow Christ. Um, that he even has the you know Jewish advantage, mm -hmm. but he'd rather, oh, this was the neatest thing. And this was again from Paul's thoughts. Um, let's see, hold on. In verse eight. It says at verse eight and nine, um, I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. But apparently, according to Paul's research, what was really written was more on the order of in order that I may embrace Christ and be embraced by him, which I love. Um, that he, Paul is basically saying he'd rather do that than be circumcised. He'd rather give up his Jewish advantage, basically, and have Christ be with him. Yeah. But again, it's kind of a weird, it's kind of weird yeah. shift. It's fine. It's just, um, yeah, maybe, maybe not, not quite as flowing right there. Um, what I was going to say, actually, I read something today about, uh, I guess, a, something that's going to be written up in a paper um, where a scholar has found evidence of like a, is it some additional text for Matthew 12, I think it is. Um, and it's it, it's using a, a technology that is able to kind of peel away layers of text from the same, uh, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, I don't know. What, I'm trying to think what material it was, if it was papyrus or if it was. Because um, vellum they used to scrape and then reuse. Yeah. So, um, but the, the um, if it's papyrus, you know, I guess it was just was not in um, great supply. And so, you know, they would just erase and kind of write over. Oh. And, and this is actually looking down two layers um, wow. to, to, to look at this material. Um, so anyway, from, from one of an ancient um, biblical text, I think that was on file or, you know, the archives at the Vatican or something like that. Um, this is really fascinating. You know, so, it sounds like a technique that I've heard about uh, for many years about x-raying paintings and seeing some of the 
what the basic layer that went under what finally ended up as the the print. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it, one observation for a you know, class like this is that really um, makes us think a little bit more about the text and you know authorship and and a lot of assumptions that we make about it at a glance are like oh it's more complicated than that um, and I think in some ways I can feel discouraging but it's it's also just a, a realization that um, you know the the text that we have did, didn't just kind of fall from the you know fall from the sky and um, we have to you know engage the text through the spirit. Um, to get understanding. It's not just something that we can, you know, read with our eyes and know exactly what it is. Um, you know, even, even reading the four Gospels where you know, something is in one of the Gospels that doesn't appear in the other three, uh, you, know, you look at what the motivation for putting that in at least was, whether, you know, the, the end of Mark is something that uh, the earliest manuscripts don't include. Um, and I think there, there are more than that one example where uh, if you go back and see what was originally there, uh, it's been supplemented some. Mm -hmm. um, the second half of the of Philippians 3, we really get a, a kind of a listing of various things that Paul has had to suffer. Uh, what's his what's his reflection on all that? That it's all worth it yeah. compared to the knowledge of knowing knowing uh, Jesus. And then he kind of adds a couple phrases, not just knowing Jesus, but knowing uh, Jesus in his resurrection and knowing Jesus in the fellowship of his suffering. You know, mm. uh, that doesn't sound real great to me. <laughs> a couple statements that uh, emphasize faith, faith in Christ, uh, God, uh, righteousness from God based on faith. That's verse nine. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, can you imagine if we had like a, a Bible study or something, a small group of fellowship of suffering? <laughs> you know, and, and and yet, I mean that that does um, you know express a very uh, kind of I don't know, critical aspect of the Christian life and you know, how we mm -hmm. deal with suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine uh, uh, your your study on death uh, might have included uh, some how do we deal with suffering. Uh, loss, yeah. People that are sick, people that are in relationships, uh, uh, widows and uh, divorcees, that sort of thing, go through some grievous experiences. Mm -hmm. What I wrote down for this part is that he's He's telling the Philippians to forget what lies behind them and just move forward mm -hmm. and just to keep moving forward um, and stand firm in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to Philippians 4, probably the most um, encouraging portion of the letter. Which I always read this and think of the song, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Yeah. <laughs> Diane knows that one. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Philippians seems to have a double benediction that... Uh, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and all your minds in Christ Jesus, uh, comes well before the, the one that's at the end. Mm. So 
So again, more notes from Paul Matson that I thought were so cool because I'm such a word geek. The root of the Greek word meaning rejoice means leaning toward, indicating we should lean toward God and not circumstances. And then in verse six, when it says, do not worry about anything, the old English, and I don't know how to say this, if it's Bergen, the German W or Wergen, is the root of worry, to worry. It literally means to strangle. Mm. So like, don't let yourself be strangled by worry, kind of. Or don't strangle yourself, which I thought was really interesting. I, I like his uh, little list of whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever, mm -hmm. is, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. Is there any excellence in these, uh, anything worthy of praise? Think about these things. Our Bible study. Mm -hmm. Um. So let's let's talk a little bit about a little bit about the um, the experience. Um, Do I want to end? Oh, end. Oh, the last Two, part. Four, ten. Sure. Go ahead. Well, you go. I mean, whatever. Yeah. I just thought there's a whole another section. Oh, okay. <laughs> go for it. What do you? Well, this is the part where he's talking about he's learned to be content with whatever he has. And he can do all things through him who strengthens mm -hmm. him. Um, he's also thanking the Philippians for their concern and their gifts of support. And tells them that because of their sacrifices on his behalf, um, my God will fully satisfy every need of yours. Yeah, Philippians 4.13 is pretty well... That's a that's a good yeah. uh, mug T-shirt type thing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, um, let's talk about let's talk about the the um, the experience. Um, we've been on for the last well longer than 30 weeks but for 30 sessions um did i'm curious if anybody um did the exercise to go back to something from <laughs> one of the scriptures from uh discovery number one and then write notes and then compare them did anybody do that yeah i did that you know what i wrote down for any of the ones in uh the study number one what nothing you didn't write anything down? It's totally blank. Oh. <laughs> I apparently wasn't with it yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, would, I didn't have this book at first. Somebody else was. Oh, yeah. Curtis, does have something? You're, you're muted. I didn't know if you're. I was just going to say, um, I don't think we had our books that first session, and that's okay. why we didn't take notes. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you for bailing us out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I was really going to do it, that. but mine was blank too. And I think, I I think it's because I missed the first section, maybe. <laughs> It didn't occur uh, to me to go to the second chapter. Silly yeah. let, let, let's just kind of talk about um, takeaways from from this experience. Uh, what's something that um, you've gleaned from this? Either, you know, following the format here, any discoveries that you've made, any questions that remain from, um, from this study? So I would say the way this course was formatted really helped me understand the Bible. So, you know, like the, the way it wasn't just sequentially, we weren't just reading sequentially. It was kind of divvied up into 
things so that are chunked together. Um, that was really helpful. And I think the best thing has just been going through this, the process of going through it with all of you, because if I was just doing this on my own, bleh, you know, mm-hmm. I get what my little thoughts are out of it, but hearing everybody else's thoughts has been so, so helpful and enriching and just really wonderful. Yeah, you know, everybody that's participated in this um, has has made the, the the class and makes the experience unique. I mean, th- this couldn't be replicated with any, you know, any different group of people. So there's something uh, about doing this, like you're saying, I think doing the journey, you know, together and um, the insights that we've gained. And I think what we've we've seen is something that we believe, you know, right, that the that it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we um, can understand Scripture, and so we're we're hearing the Spirit speak through one another in this process. Yeah, and I just I'll keep talking. <laughs> I didn't know because um, I hadn't really. I tried to read the Bible before. Okay, I'm going to start with Genesis. Okay, I'm going to start again with Genesis, and I'm like I'm just bogged down, you know. Um, and so apart from participating in other Bible study classes, studying little sections of it, I hadn't read kind of through as much of it as we did here. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how much I would appreciate Ecclesiastes. <laughs> I just really did. Um, I guess because of its sort of really practical take on, you know, this is human experience and this is how it is and God is in charge and we don't always understand what or why, but it's okay. We just need to kind of accept that there is suffering and there is good and there's all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I liked that. And then also just Holy Week, the way we were able to be studying about Holy Week, right? During the part of the year when it was all happening and just the, um, the rapidity of events from when Christ, when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem to his death, like it just happened so fast. I was really struck by that. Hmm. I found that um, I put in quite a bit of time in the study uh, more than I would have anticipated at the beginning of the class Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I found that good I'm not sure how much spiritual growth I got out of that, but it, just the experience of trying to look at things uh, seriously as though it was a real class and not a bit of fluff. Um, so I, I found it rewarding that way. Mm-hmm. I learned. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I also learned uh, a fair amount about the. Uh, the exile, which uh, the Babylonian exile and the splitting of the two kingdoms uh, had not been near the depth that I had uh, heard about before in that. Uh, Brett, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I it just really feels like to me, and I have not taken uh, Bible classes at at university, but it, it feels like to me, it's, it would be my idea of what like a, a upper level uh, class taking a, a, a university class in uh, theology. And it just, it, it had a lot of feel to that, uh, like that to me uh, as we went through it. I, I, you know, for most of my life, um, I, I've the experience, my experience of, of Christianity and, and spirituality has been, you know, what I would call maybe uh, a two o'clock in the morning Christian, where I really felt the power of God and, and the Holy Spirit waking up at two o'clock in the morning with some heavy burden on my mind. And then to me, that's that's real stuff. But then to go on and, and into this more of the intellectual part of it, like you mentioned early on, Matt, about, uh, you know, talking about discussing uh, the people that 
actually produce this literature and, and what they were going through and, and their experiences and, and how that would, their, their uh, personalities would, would uh, temper what they wrote and, and the, the things that they preached. And uh, that, just that, that component, that angle uh, has been really refreshing. And it's, what it's done is uh, helped the spiritual growth at two o'clock in the morning uh, spirituality that, that I feel like I've had for m most of my life. Mm. It's, it's helped that it's, it's enhanced it. And it's, uh, it's just been real refreshing. Cool. Yeah. I can tell you if any of you go on to seminary and you take you like it, I don't know if they call it the same thing now, but I took, uh, you know, the intro uh, Old Testament, New Testament, OTO1 and NTO1, um, each is, you know, a semester each, uh, you, you'd, you'd be well prepared, not fully, but, but pretty well prepared for that. So, yeah, just the insights that I've gained listening to you folks have, has been incredible, it really has. Uh, just just a, a wealth of, of knowledge and understanding I've gained. I won't speak for Diane, but that I've gained from just, just from listening uh, has been great. Well, for me, it's, it's more personalized my relationship with the Lord um, and taught me a lot of things and, I know when, um, because I'm going to make a big change in my life and people are saying, are you ready to give up this? You ready to give up that? Yeah, I am. I think the Lord has prepared me for it. And um, I can still, the important things in my life I can still have and um, consider my, my church life and activities and uh, wanting to be of worthwhile um, in the church and friendship for people. And I, I know how important it is to me to be in the presence, just the fellowship of friends who share my faith and we grow with each other. And no matter how old we are, we can keep growing in this. And, uh, that's that's what it's done for me is uh, giving me more of that that content and uh, acceptance of whatever changes are going to have to happen. I think it's been interesting to me to see the uh, history of the relationship of God to people mm -hmm. uh, and the issue of uh, God establishing laws to help the people to uh, know how to live. I'm still struggling with how does uh, Jesus Christ come to fulfill the law I'm still struggling with that. What does that really mean? Um, but I, I think that um, you're, you see God working with the Jews, and then he, he's the uh, journey is spread out to all people people all around the world and so i i think it's just interesting to see how uh the holy spirit has been at work um to people of different cultures and languages Who else? Tom or Diane? Artist? I mean, like that. Why? Go ahead. 
I guess I like that it was, you know, very organized and scholarly and it really helped me put things in perspective and how different parts of the Bible all fit into the whole. Um, I really liked, you know, when we were doing the note taking and all that there were always the search begins and there were those questions and those kind of helped me um, focus, you know, when I would reread it, what, what maybe I needed to look for. Mm. But um, yeah, I usually I just, you know, work with one book of the Bible or you, you know, have a message at church and you have a passage and you focus on that or something from devotional things. But just doing the whole thing, I think really helps put things in perspective and to see the story of, um, the Jewish people and everything, and then Christ and um, the new message, I don't know, just made a lot more sense in the, the, the completeness of it. Mm -hmm. I had occasion uh, earlier in the week to look at the, uh, the course description and uh, whoever was writing it said that, you know, they weren't trying to uh, what, give you a set of facts that you need to work from and and learn what they wanted you to learn. It was more a guided study and uh, what you would learn was what we shared with one another and you learned from reading this book that uh, the Bible, you know, what did you get out of it as you read it? What, what questions came up uh, and you know, trying to, to struggle with understanding it. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I really appreciate that teaching style. I think it's also interesting that the issue of the covenant uh, changed and the seeing the the change and what that means. Mm -hmm. did, did the covenant itself change or did it get amplified? Or are there more, more covenants made that didn't supersede the first one, but that added to it? That could be a good segue for the the follow up study to this. Uh, when we're going to take a we're going to take some time off before we come back with another offering, if if you know people are interested. So um, we'll, we'll look at some themes, uh, another kerygma study that looks at themes of um, like covenant, for instance, throughout the throughout the scripture. Now that's going to say one thing that has. Um, you know, kind of been impressed upon me, maybe a couple things in our, our reading and the study this, this time around is, um, you know, it's the idea of uh, how different, um, different things in scripture, you know, change over time in the, in terms of understanding of say something like covenant, how that, that changed over time through the experience of the people you know, looking back maybe at Exodus and then trying to deal with the exile and Roman occupation and things like that. Um, even as we were talking about with Paul, you know, some of his writings, they, the, the, looking at Philippians tonight, um, gives us a, a, a sense of the progression of his thought, maybe to an extent. Um, and um, something I was using as kind of a springboard for a sermon recently and thinking about the, you know, the concept of Israel and um, and how that understanding changed over, you know, over time. And so when we look at um, the scriptures, I mean, what, when I think maybe Brett mentioned scholarly, you know, there's some scholarly element when we, you know, studying the scripture. I always kind of felt like when that comes up, it's like, you know, it's, especially when you look at Bible studies, uh, you know, go to a Christian bookstore and you look at the Bible studies they have there. I remember that we used to, you know, get a, a little packaged Bible study and uh, we wrestled and wrestled and wrestled trying to find, you know, a good Bible study. 
And it felt like there was like, well, this is more kind of a personal faith, spiritual, and this one's more, this is too academic, too scholarly or something. And and the, the idea that, you know, un, until or unless we can dig in a little bit more in the scriptures and understand some of the, you know, the um, foundational pieces of, you know, who, why, who, what, where, and when around it, the, the, we, we can never really get much depth out of the, you know, out of the scriptures. Um, and, you know, we know more about the people that, that you know, wrote something and what they experienced, and we can understand more of the words that, that are presented to us. So anyway, there's just a sense of that, a little more of that, that depth of understanding has come out to me in the, in the study. And then the part that we looked at, like we're studying with Ruth right now, and the idea of, you know, um, Ruth and Jonah being written as, uh, you know, kind of a um, counter argument to what Ezra and Nehemiah, you know, were, were, were talking about. It's like, that was really, that's, that's pretty cool, you know, kind of eye opener. Um, the Bible's hard. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not easy. Um, Somebody mentioned, you know, it, it, it is a fair amount of work, obviously, from, from week to week. And um, uh, you're here, I think, at the very end because you tackled that most most times at least uh, or gave it, you know, gave it a good effort. Um, I'm kind of curious if you, um, let's say we do the in-depth study, whenever that, that, that will be. And somebody approaches you and says, hey, you know, I know that you took part in that, you know, Discovering the Bible series. Um, you know, Pastor Matt's doing an, another one here. Um, what did you think? What am I getting into? <laughs> you know, what would you tell them about this, uh, um, about this in, as they're thinking about something, you know, future study? It's, it's in-depth and it's good, but it is literally hours of work every week. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a lot of time. Yeah, I felt often what spoke to me was different than what spoke to some other people. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, I tend to feel this way any about time. I think about scripture, and that's why I I'm not afraid to write in my Bible, and I'll go back and oh, that's what it said to me then. Yeah, that's not what it says to me now. So yeah, I I did I spent a lot of hours, and uh, then I come to class and. Other people had different ideas than I did about what it said. <laughs> I I often really liked the, you know, the focusing the search or the putting it together sections more than just necessarily taking notes on each mm. scripture passage. I thought it was really interesting to compare them or, you know, when we were asked to do a little drawing or do something like that. Um, that was really the map thing. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. I liked that. I like the map, but don't ask me to draw or write a letter to somebody. Those really were hard for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there, it's not always, yeah, yeah. Some weeks it was different than others, but yeah. those were really interesting to me. Yeah. Some of those are a little harder to bring out in the class structure because that's, mm -hmm. that's maybe a little more personal for you, you know, and even some of the questions for tonight about, you know, where, where do you go from here and things? Um, I mean, if you want to share them, you, you know, you can, if you've reflected on that. Yeah, and I, in, in all fairness to Matt, uh, for every hour that I put in, he's put in more than that yeah. in order to prepare for the class. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, and he's got to be prepared for our stupidity. I don't know about the stupidity, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Our lack, at least. <laughs> I'm not sure that I could tell someone else, uh, you know, how if if we were to go to the uh, new study, what it would be like, because I think that study would be very different from what we're doing now mm -hmm. but uh i'd probably say well it helps you or makes you think mm -hmm. you you gotta 
think about what you're reading and maybe you'll learn something. <laughs> I took a lot of Bible classes at Whitworth and never spent the hours on them that I've spent on this. <laughs> I mean, what do they say that you can read the same thing over and over again and you get something new from it every yeah. time? I just don't think I thought in, in the true depth back then when I was in my late teens and early 20s. Mm. Right. <laughs> yeah, you bring a little more life experience to it now, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Paul talked about that maturity in, in Philippians. Yeah. I recognize more how much more I need Christ in my life. I mean, I just kind of sailed along there and... Uh, I look back now and I think, who God really was doing things I wasn't aware of, for which I'm very grateful. <laughs> I think an extended class like this, though, um, there's a kind of continuity to it that gives people a, a unique opportunity to get to know each other a little bit differently, uh, that you don't get in a science school class where people come and go, or you don't get looking at the backs of people's head on Sunday morning. Uh, I really feel like I have know you all a little bit better and whoever thought that would happen on Zoom for crying out loud. You know? <laughs> but I, I attribute it just to kind of the duration and the sort of continuity in the study itself, I think. So for people who kind of feel a little bit uh, distant maybe in church, I think this really represents, <clears throat> excuse me, a good opportunity to make some connections at a little different level. And I think that's helpful. So that's kind of my comment on the class and the structure. I did say this or not, but I'm a little bit um, unhinged. That's maybe a little bit too strong. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what I think about the Bible right uh, after this class. Hmm. Um, you know, if you grew up pledging allegiance to the Bible and it was the immutable word of God, and then you kind of get to the place, well, it really is just what we need to know for faith and life and what we need to know about God. You're, and and now, you know, you look at issues with manuscripts and interpretive biases that perhaps run throughout that uh cultural implications that maybe you never even considered that impact the message. You know, I'm sitting here wondering at the end of this, really, if the Bible is the um, kind of the record of interaction between God and humanity in this one kind of group <laughs> and in this one stream of history. I mean, really, what's to distinguish it, assuming it's truthful, from other records of God's interaction uh, with people, maybe more contemporary, or God's interaction with um, Christians across the ages. I mean, if truth is truth, and if it's the Holy Spirit that sort of interprets this and applies it to our life, how is the Bible uniquely distinguished other than its unique history as a document? But if its purpose is to inform us about what God is doing and how God works and about our need and on and on we go, then it seems to me there are a lot of wonderful Christian things that have been written that follow in that same path, you know. And how are we to take that then, truly? Uh, so... Yeah, I'm just kind of sorting that out. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody else, but it just, I guess it's just not fixed. So for someone who's grown up with it fixed, that takes a bit of sorting. You got your work cut out for you. <laughs> I, I think one of the uh, things that I did uh, a couple different times 
during my faith journey was to write uh, the equivalent of one of our church confessions. What do I believe? Uh, what are the fundamentals that I believe? And I, I think, you know, your question, Wayne, is a little bit like that. What what part of the the Bible is is really the 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 rock that your uh, belief is built on, and how much of it are you willing to see crumble? Um, and how uh -huh. much is how limited is the Holy Spirit in working with me by virtue of my own problems, you know, or my own inabilities to be worked with, if you will? Mm. You know, that's the other thing, too. So, I don't know. It just seems like it opens up a lot of a lot of uh, possibilities. I guess you're going to frame it positively or pitfalls. <laughs> well, <clears throat> um, yeah, and... Um... Wayne, those are all great questions, and those are good, I think, good things to wrestle with. Um, but it's hard to, you know, there's no quick, easy, you know, response. Um, I'll tell you a couple stories, though. Uh, I was saying that some of this will prepare you for, you know, the OT and NT01. <laughs> and um, but I remember, you know, some of the, some of the, um, you know, kind of, I don't know, arguments and things, debates that erupted in like those intro classes, like especially OT01, for instance. And, um, you know, looking at, at these kind of, a, you know, the scholarly work and so on that, um, you know, these are people that are going to seminary, right? I mean, this is a, this is a three-year master's degree program. And, um you know, some of the stuff that we're looking at our intro class are just blowing people's minds. Um, you know, I mean, this isn't like going to, you know, to, to Bible camp or something like that. I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty rigorous. And, um, you know, fortunately, we had been prepared because we took a Bethel Bible. Some of you may have heard of the Bethel Bible series. Uh, we took a Bethel Bible series class we got through just the old, new old testament part of the new testament yeah we got through like one and a half years of it yeah and um but the the woman teaching it um she went beyond just what was in the materials of the you know of the um bethel series and brought in uh more that you know to help us understand and kind of kind of learn and i felt like when i went to you know the ot01 uh, I was pretty pretty well prepared. A lot of the things that that they threw out there, um, I already at least had some some knowledge of. Um, and so anyway, um, this is the part of what you know, of complexifying scripture, you know, that um, I think is kind of necessary. It's like you know, it's like working muscles. You know, the you you build muscles by by tearing them, right? And um, so a story I want to share with you is, um, uh, I can't, I don't, were spouses, you can tell me, remind me if spouses, if spouses were there for this or not, but, um, we had a gathering early on my first year in seminary, uh, that, um, like toward the beginning of that first semester and the president addressed, uh, addressed us in the, um, in the student, um, union. And I, that's yeah, why, we okay. The spouses team. Okay. There was a spouses thing. And, um, and he was, he was talking to us and he said, um, you know, something to the effect of, um, we're not here, you know, the, the faculty administration, we're, we're not here, um, so much to build your faith as to tear your faith apart. If that's what this, the seminary education, you know, will, will do. Um, and so it's kind of like, yeah, it's not like a Bible camp or whatever, um, and and this is what's going to happen, you know. But, you know, he's just kind of laying it out there. This is what's going to happen, and um, and but you know, you have a community, you know, one another, um, and he he basically talked to, you know, about relying on the on the community and understanding this is kind of what you're getting into. And um, you know, we're not here to build your faith. That's that's God's work and the work of the Spirit. Um, 
but you know, as we go through, you're going to find that that it's like we're tearing your faith apart. Um, because you know the the simple, you know, um, I, I don't know. I have to look at it. I have to look at a, a you know my children's Bible to see how do they address genocide and you know in Joshua. You know, and other than, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and stuff. I mean, for the crossing over into, you know, the promised land, um, maybe the walls of Jericho or something, you're not going to hear me preach on Joshua. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but it's there. And, and you know, when we when we crack those pages open, we, we have to kind of wrestle with that a little bit. Um, we get in the midst of the arguments going on, you know, post exile. And people trying to figure out what to do, um, you know, with the the people of the land, and you know what they're wrestling with the same questions in Israel today, right? You know, do we build more of this wall to separate us from the West Bank? Do we build more settlements? Um, is you know, is, is there another way to um, to gain peace? Um, you know, uh, what is the mandate of Israel, Zion? You know, is it to be a light to the nations? Is it to be, a, you know, uh, um, uh, its own people that that occupy this land? Th those questions that are being wrestled with today are the same questions that are wrestled with in scriptures. And that's part of what this study has introduced to us. Um, you know, so. Um, and I guess I would add that the, you know, that the 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 Bible. Um, I mean, the. The Bible is not the Book of Mormon, right? That in terms of the, you know, there there are no other copies of the Book of Mormon because Joseph Smith found these tablets and the Umum and Thurum and whatever, and you know, translated all this into one text, and that's what they have. The Bible, the Bible that we hold in our hands, is not that. You know, um, but you, you can find that book in Welch. You can find it in, in other languages. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same. Yeah. So you know, um, I, I hope that makes it richer, but it also makes it it does make it a little bit scarier. And you know, I don't know if anybody else is in the same area where Wayne what Wayne expressed, but it can feel like the you know the ground's kind of shaking. Brett. No, I. Just I, I could echo a lot of what Wayne said. Just the, some of those issues that that used to be again as a as a child and a teen and so forth. <clears throat> there was there was a lot of certainty, and then as things kind of become unmoored, <laughs> there's less and less certainty. But that's we circle back to the fundamentals, uh, and it's there's there is certainty in that. So mm -hmm. I. I I heard what you're saying, Wayne, for sure. I really like that book by Rachel Held Evans, Faith Unraveled. And I don't know if any of you know who she is. Or, <laughs> I, I've heard of her, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank, we read that book in um, our small group study. But anyway, she kind of goes through her faith journey, and she was raised in a very fundamental uh, tradition in oh, what was the name of the place? Um, Monkey Town. <laughs> I can't think. Um, anyway, in the South, and went to Bible school. You know, everything was like that. And and then, um, you know, everybody was so strong, and they just <laughs> they knew what you know. <laughs> They had it all figured out and we're taught that. And then she starts to question everything and come up with all these questions she just can't deal with. But anyway, uh, the chapters in that book are, are really interesting. And like one's called the war stories and the fish stories. <laughs> and she kind of really dwells on the mystery of the Bible, you know, and finds the, I don't know, the essence, I think. But she has a lot of, uh, well, she, she died a few years ago, but she has a lot of um, questions too, which she thinks that is, is really an important part of faith. And 
anyway, I, I found that very, very helpful. You know, um, if you're interested or you study in any human development, um, you realize that, you know, there's there we have different aspects of like our cognitive abilities and things, um, you know, as we as we get, you know, go from infancy, you know, in through adulthood and, and you know, as we get, and get older. And um, I think, you know, maybe one framework for you to think about a little bit is that oftentimes people in their faith, um, I kind of feel like as a whole, maybe um, faith wise don't necessarily get beyond adolescence. And by that, what I mean is that there's a there's a there's an intersection with adolescence and kind of fairly concrete thinking that um, you know it it uh, relates well with like with faith and like youth group and things you know that that people can um, you know ad adapt some of the teachings that they're that they're getting and they they have they form a fairly concrete set you know kind of a faith idea. Um, and maybe that's what President Gillespie was getting at when he was talking about, you know, these people in seminary, um, you know, is that you, it's almost like you're kind of moving on to a different, a different stage here. And um, so, you know, the uh, digging in a little bit more kind of challenges some of those, some of those elements that, that maybe, uh, you know, we've kind of grown settled with. Um and that that might be part of part of the experience of, of doing a study like this. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the scripture is a there's a lot of paradox in scripture that we have to wrestle with, um, you know, faith and works, right? Grace and so on. Um, and um, and mystery just, you know, Try and at some point we we have to just put our kind of put our hands up and and uh, trust in the mist you know some of the mystery that we experience here. The scripture that I looked at, by the way, in looking back at uh, the first lesson was from Isaiah fifty five, and um, you know my ways are not your ways, um, and just kind of reflecting you know reflecting on that. And yet still even. Then in that scripture talking about, you know, as the, the rains come down from the heavens that, you know, my word will be fulfilled. Uh, and the idea that uh, God's word, God's will is fulfilled um, in people like us and, and people like us are like, you know, people that are expressed in here. Um, that, that wrestle with God, wrestle with the questions that we wrestle with and so on. Well, I think that's a good recommendation for taking the class. Sorry, I didn't leave. I just didn't want to have to deal with my blinking camera here. Yeah. <laughs> didn't but want to have a seizure or something. Your camera, no not your light source. Then. Class is enough of a headache. We don't need any more. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any any closing closing thoughts here? We just a few minutes a uh, few minutes left. Uh, was it worthwhile? Yeah. Oh, heavens, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very positive experience. I think it helps us get to know you a little bit more, more too, Matt. So I think that's good. Oh. How's the, and, and how's the format on, on Zoom? Uh, I, I'll, I'll preface that by saying that, you know, looking at the leader's guide and how's all this stuff about, you know, materials, supplies, and things that you need. And I have to throw all, all that out for this, um, you know, because, I mean, you know, lighting a candle, um, you, you know, setting up a table or, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, we, we don't have to do any of that in, in this format. But how's it, how's it been overall? I mean, um, you know, traditionally, this would have been something you do in person. I like classes in person. And at the same time for an evening class, I'm not, I, once I get home, I'm not going out again. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Zoom made it much more possible for me to participate. I think I would have preferred it in person, but I agree with you, Vicki. It's kind of nice to be home at the same time.
Yeah. It's easier to show up, at least, if we're by by Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's hard because I think all of us probably have some part of us, you know, we'd rather be together in a room of people, but at the same time, it's like, oh my gosh, especially when it's winter and it's dark by 420, you know, nobody wants to go outside. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I have so. to say that like on a, like tonight, this would be great to be in person, you know, and remember we had even talked about the, you know, at the end to, to gather in person. Um, but man, in the middle of the winter, you know, thinking about going to and coming home in the dark and, you know, kind of rain. It's like, so. it's nice to just keep, you know, keep a sweatshirt on and, you know, just come over and turn on the computer and stuff. Well, and you don't have to cancel class for weather, too. Right. Yeah. That's it got really bad. I think maybe one thing that I might might do um, you know, in the next, next go around might be to uh, get together um, at a couple milestone points, maybe in person, and uh, you know have that experience. Uh, yeah, certainly, a party at the end. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would probably find I'm great at thinking about it, and not good at executing things like that. So I'd, I'd probably have to some point ask a few people say, "Hey, you want to plan something for us at the end? That'd be great." Um, <laughs> so, um, Maybe well, one idea to consider, and I don't know if this would work at all. It might not, but um, given how much time we were mostly spending in between classes preparing, maybe sometimes we could divvy it up and say, you know, okay, Vicki, you take this section, read it thoroughly, be prepared to you know, really mm -hmm. discuss it, and kind of divvy it up so there was a little bit less work in between. That might work sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or even in in yeah in a general sense, if yeah, uh, I, I'd have to look. I um, it's been so long, I don't recall. I've got the materials for the the other. Um, well, if it's like themes, yeah, depending how many passages, you could even have like two people do the same one because they might bring different things to it or whatever. Kind of yeah, that's kind it, of a neat idea. It, yeah, like uh, did have any of you looked at the videos? Like you missed a class and you went through and watched the video. I did once. You did once? Because <clears throat> there, I, I, we don't know exactly who, but um, I was asking Lauren, you know, because the um, videos are only ac accessible to us uh, or if, you know, if you, through your email and stuff. Um, and each week there's a, a few people are watching. So, um, mm. you know, and I know there's some people that, that uh, haven't been, um, you know, have, have for different reasons have been with us and stuff. And so I, I haven't checked with them. So that's probably one thing I'll do in the future is just maybe take attendance and stuff too, at least to market. So. Yeah, we, I, th I think the first meeting we had probably close to 20 people mm -hmm. and we now all fit on one screen here. Uh, what is that? So we have 11 people oh, tonight. Yeah. So we, we, we lost some people yeah, we, along the way. Yeah. And maybe they're watching but, uh, well, yeah, and there's um, probably what four people at least I think that that are been pretty regular that are not with us tonight. So um, that's, yeah, you know, that's kind of I think the, the sense of participation at least, where uh, you know I tend to speak up too much, but where you anticipate that everybody brings something something to the uh, the the meeting uh, that they can share. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty impressed with uh, the level of participation and and commitment that you've all made. Thank you so much for for being part of the journey. Um, you know, I've I've learned um, along with you, and so um, you know, I mean, the, the scripture is li the living word, right? Um, and um, so I, I hope this inspires you to continue to study and look forward to hopefully see most, if not all of you, um, when we we pick up the more in-depth one. Again, we haven't figured out when. It might be a year from, might be, you know, not this school year, but the starting the fall of 24. We'll see how that goes. Uh, or maybe the spring of next year. We'll see if I get the itch. But 
Thank you all. Um, I'll close this in, uh, in prayer. And if you have other thoughts, comments, uh, please send me a note. I'd love to hear from you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, your spirit opening your word for us. And um, thank you for the commitment of uh, all of these folks uh, to, to study together and um, to learn, to learn from one another as, uh, as you've opened uh, the Bible to us. Continue, Lord, to walk with us and help us to grow in our understanding that um, our faith would grow, our, our witness would be strong, and a um, sense of your presence um, with us in all times and places would deepen. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.